So I have a story within a story. I'm going to tell a personal anecdote and then a Balinese legend followed by another personal anecdote. I lived and worked in Indonesia for six years. I was a volunteer English teacher and I started with a post in Sumatra. But when I moved to a post in Bali, I decided to make a life change. You see, it had always been my ulterior motive to go there to be a writer. I wanted to write a novel, the great American novel. And when I was living in Sumatra, I had a house on campus and there were students coming and going all the time, so I never had the privacy to write. So when the Balinese University offered me a place on campus, I said no. I envisioned a house in the middle of a vast rice field on the outskirts of town. And that's exactly what I found. The landlord was all too happy to rent to me, a Westerner. He was getting a good price. However, our dealings hit a snag when he learned I would be living alone. Aren't you afraid to live alone, he asked. Afraid? Of what? I asked. He narrowed his eyes and he never said anything, but he remained reluctant to rent me the property. However, any genuine concern he had for my well-being was eventually outweighed by the good tourist price he was giving, getting. And so I began my life as a writer. By day, I would bang away on this old typewriter all day long with nothing to distract me, nothing to break my concentration. And when evening rolled around, I would mount this big black bicycle the landlord had provided me with and coast five kilometers down to the center of town where I taught from 5.30 in the evening all the way to 10.30 at night. It was pretty typical after class for me to spend some time with my students we would cross the street and enter the night market where we would enjoy plates of fried rice. I would always order a glass of hot, freshly ground Balinese coffee. And then I would make my preparations for my journey home. Mr. Brandon, one of my students asked, aren't you afraid living alone? Afraid of what? I said dramatically, ghosts? And then I leaned in. I'm only afraid of one thing around here, and that's Balinese dogs, I said. And everybody laughed. Now, most teachers kept their students' work and some books in their briefcase. Not me. I only kept one thing in my briefcase, and that was rocks. My students would often help me gather stones and chunks of cement with rebar sticking out, bits of the crumbling cement from the steps of the market itself. I had this one smart Alex student who would bring things that were for sale in the market. Once he showed up with a scythe or a grass knife and he said, Mr. Brandon, use this and they'll kick the bucket. He liked to practice idioms. He had a hoe one time and he said, this will really knock their socks off. Oh yes, and I remember the day he pulled out this decorative bullwhip from the island of Madura that was for sale in the market. He used a Balinese idiom that was completely lost in translation. Use this, Mr. Brandon, and you'll have them smiling through their anuses. All the students laughed. But this was no joke. On my ride home, I had to build up momentum. Momentum for the one intersection now by day, this was a busy place with buses and trucks and cars and horses pulling carts and pedestrians, but at night it was all but abandoned. In fact, the only person around was this old man who would sit there every night on his veranda overlooking the intersection. I think I was one of the most interesting parts of his day. He would spot me coming and check the intersection, look back at me and the intersection where every dog in the entire neighborhood was waiting for me. 
as I entered the intersection, I had to pull my feet up onto the top bar of the frame of the bicycle. I had to flip open my briefcase and start hurling projectiles down into the snapping snouts of these dogs. Their yelps and howls would punctuate their growling, just like the Balinese flute does the rumble of the gamelan. The old man would jab the air and punch his fist like he was watching a boxing match on TV. At the edge of the intersection, at the other side, I would drop my feet down and continue pedaling. The old man would stand up, turn and go into his house, presumably to retire for the night. Twice, my pants were ripped. Once, I actually needed stitches. But I always made it to the other side. One night, I was expecting a particularly vigorous fight with the dogs. The moon was out and it was a warm evening. But to my surprise, no dogs. It was completely empty. The old man wasn't even there. I entered the intersection leisurely. I even did a casual victory lap right in the middle of the intersection. And then I continued on my way. But then I stopped. Up in the distance, I saw this shape moving irregularly back and forth, zigging and zagging like a dog, but it was much bigger. And then to my surprise, it stood up on its hind legs. It seemed to be studying me from about a hundred yards away. And then to my horror, whoosh, it came at me incredibly quickly. I didn't even have time to react. I had turned my bicycle around, but then it stopped just several feet in front of me in the dark. I had no idea what this was. To my utter terror, a large clawed hand raised up silhouetted against the luminescence of the night sky. Now, when I watched Scooby-Doo, I always thought it was fiction when he saw, when Shaggy saw a ghost and his hair would live, raise up. Well, I'm here to tell you, it can and does, and it did happen when whatever this thing was, let out this inhuman howl. Oh, my hair stood on end, and I almost fainted, I think. Then it seemed to me like there were lights bobbing up and down all around me. There were people. It was members of the neighborhood and they were wearing their temple's finest clothing. A young man ushered me to the side of the road and he explained to me what this thing was. It was a man wearing a mask. This mask known as Rangda. This goddess had been summoned to their temple and she had been displeased with her congregation. With an eerie laugh, she had dismissed them and gone charging right out the gates of the temple and down the road, and that's when she came face to face with me. The congregation was just now catching up to her. And sure enough, they brought the gamelan instruments, they brought offerings, the priests assembled around her, and they started the ritual right there in the road. Well, trembling, I went home and I found it very difficult to sleep after that. And the next day, I was exhausted and I couldn't concentrate. And I did something I'd never done. I went down several hours early to campus and there, I met the smart aleck, Begawasi. Mr. Brandon, he said. He always had an idiom. It looks to me like you've been flying off the handle. Arr, 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 arr. Have you been flipping your wig up and down? Well, no, I said. It was something that happened last night. And he asked, have you become afraid to live alone? No, it wasn't in the house, it was in the road. There was this terrifying thing. It must have been a layak, he said seriously. They come from the graveyard to torment humans. No, 
It was a man in a mask, and the mask had two bulbous eyes, just like boiled eggs, fangs protruding from her lips, and hair that was so heavy it swayed when she moved, when this figure moved, just like salami in the window of a delicatessen. That was Rangda, my student said. That is the premier Layak, the most powerful. We summon her to our temples to drive away all the other Layaks. It's like fighting fire with fire, he said. And in this way, she is a protective goddess for every village on the island of Bali. It was then that he told me the legend behind this mask, and it's known as the Chalon Arang epic. This epic begins in 11th century Indonesia, in a perfect realm, under a wonderful king known as Arlanga. Everywhere there was prosperity and happiness and health. The rice grew heavy with grain. The cattle were all sleek and fat and the sounds of cheerful laughter could be heard from inside everyone's home. Yes, everyone was happy, all except for one woman in one dark place. Her name was Walu Nateng Dira, the widow of the village of Dira. And she was upset because nobody would marry her daughter, Ratna Mangali. All the young suitors found her quite beautiful, but they feared, rightly so, having Walu Natengdira as a mother-in-law because they were suspicious that she practiced black magic. Outraged, Walu Natengdira demanded that the King Arlanga himself marry her daughter, and when he refused, she concocted a plan a terrible plan. She assembled all of her disciples in the graveyard and instructed them, you will take the prosperity, happiness, and health of this kingdom and replace it with poverty, misery, and disease. They repeated her instructions. We will take the happiness, health, and prosperity of this kingdom and replace it with poverty, misery, and disease. Off they flew, and the effects were immediate. The rice, once heavy with grain, began to wither. The sleek, fat cattle grew gaunt, their skin hanging from their frames. And from every household now could be heard cries of despair. King Arlanga assembled his advisors, and the only thing they could think to do was to summon the great sage, Empu Brada. For surely, if there was one person who could stand up to powerful black magic, it was he. He made his epic journey from the palace out to the edge of the kingdom, to the village of Dira. On the way, what had once been these healthy rice fields were now black, rotten cesspools. He passed cattle that had fallen over dead and filled with the gases of decomposition to the size of elephant corpses. And of course, homes full of human corpses half eaten by dogs. The ground was black and oily. Trees were scorched as if by some kind of fire. And there in the center of the village of Dira, stood a hut, the hut of Walu Natengdira. Empubrada could sense she was inside, and he challenged her, Walu Natengdira, I know you're in there. I know you have taken the prosperity of these people and returned it with poverty. Come out and face me. The hut remained eerily silent. Walu Natengdira, I know you have taken the happiness of these people and instead returned it with misery, oh! The hut 
remained eerily silent. Well, you not think it up. I know you have taken the health of these people and instead returned it with disease. The hut remained eerily silent. What M. Pubarada did not realize was that inside the hut, a terrible transformation was taking place. Eventually, long fingernails, trembling with power, gripped the frame of the door. And behind those fingernails, a white face, shimmering with living energy, known as Samangat, Walunatengdira, emerged in her more powerful state, known as Rangda. And Empubrada flew at her immediately, drilling his Chris into her body, effortlessly holding her cloth on which her magic mantras were written, she swept him away and he fell to the ground half conscious. She announced herself, Aku waluna tengira! Aku adala kahidupan! Aku adala kamatian! I am life itself, I am death itself. Aku ngelawan bunas pati rajo! What Walu Natengdira didn't realize was that the sage was undergoing a transformation of his own. And when she turned, there he stood in his more powerful state, known as the Barong. They flew at one another, and sparks fell to the ground about them. They threw fireballs at each other, scorching the trees and plants. They tumbled and wrestled, causing the earth to shake. They fought all along the coast of Java, into the water and up onto the coast of Bali, and all the way around the east coast of Bali, in what is today the city of Sanur, Walu Natengdira dropped her cloth, upon which the sacred black magic mantras were written. Today, someone owns that cloth. No one knows who it is, but he is said to be the most powerful sorcerer in all of Southeast Asia. Well, into the water they fought, facing the island of Nusa Penida, where to this very day, submerged, that epic struggle continues. Rangda against Barong, Waluna Tengdira against Empu Barada, fear and death itself against life-giving energy. And it is this story that is told over and over and over again at temple cleansing ceremonies. Late one night, I was thinking about this story. Lying in bed, I could hear the tinkle of the gamelan coming from the nearby Balinese temple. And I dozed off. About three hours into the night, I awakened to an inhuman howl. Once again, my hair raised up just like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. It seemed to be coming from everywhere inside my house. I searched frantically for the source of this sound and then I stopped. At the bedroom that faced outward toward the garden, the door was open. And as I watched, it slowly swung and clicked shut. My heart was pounding, and I approached the door. Hello? Is somebody there? Hello? I held my breath as I reached for the handle of the door. Bang! Whatever it was kicked the door from inside, nearly cracking it in its frame, and I tumbled over backward, and before I knew it, I was running up the muddy path to the street, where, to my surprise, I was met with a crowd of people from the neighborhood, once again, wearing their temple finest. A young man asked me if I had seen this, 
Rangda. No, I said, <sighs> but I think I know where she is. I led them down the path, all the people into the garden. They were bringing the gamelan instruments. Offerings were placed about the yard right in front of the door. Priests were assembled. Everyone focused their attention on the door. Sure enough, it slowly creaked open. Long fingernails, trembling with power, gripped the frame of the door. And behind those nails, a white face appeared, shimmering with living energy known as Samangat. Rangda stepped out. Everyone knelt out of respect to their goddess. She seemed to study every member of her congregation. And then she raised her clawed hand and ah! <laughs> gave an eerie laugh and jumped off the veranda and began to chug her way through the crowd, which parted immediately. People on the right, people on the left, leaving a path to the gate of my garden. One man tried to fit into the left and then to the right. Unfortunately, he was midway, right in her path, when she collided with him, pop, sending him flying backward into a rice field. Without missing a step, without breaking her pace, she made the turn and went chugging up that mud path to the road and down the road toward the city. Everybody in the congregation stood up, picked up the instruments, the offerings, and with the priests, they headed up the path and down the street to chase their goddess into the night. The only one to remain was that young man who had been hit into the rice field. His sister had stayed behind too to help him clean up. The poor guy was muddy and wet. He was trying to light a cigarette, but his matches had been ruined. Needless to say, that night I couldn't sleep very well. The next day, I was exhausted. I couldn't concentrate. And so once again, I headed down to campus hours early where I met that same smart alecky student, Begawasi. Mr. Brandon, he said, and this must be another one of his idioms that has been lost in translation because he told me my face looks just like a Chinese man with his pants down farting. <laughs> that was when I told him. I admitted it. I told him I was afraid to live alone. And I asked him if he wanted to move in with me. No, he said immediately. And when I asked why, he said, mm, because I am very busy. I think with everything that was going on up at my house, he was afraid. One good thing came out of this, though. I became good friends with that sister and brother. And eventually, it was they who moved in with me. The sister cooked and cleaned. The young, younger brother, he tended the garden, and it was he who taught me Indonesian language. I provided them simply with a place to live, and I enjoyed their company. We became like a happy little family. I never did write the great American novel, but it was from these two, this brother and sister, that I learned many many great Indonesian stories. I miss that brother and sister. And in spite of the dogs and in spite of the demons, I miss Bali too. Thank you.